I'm here in a emery oak grove, a mixed oak woodland actually, with predominant uh, emery oak species. And I uh, thought I'd stop and talk a little bit about this unique oak uh, in a unique uh, oak woodlands and a bit of the culture uh, surrounding these oak trees that goes back centuries, if not millennia. Uh, I've been interested in oak trees and, and acorns for many years, and I've spoken about um, the ancient history of oaks and acorns relative to foods that we've eaten uh, predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere as humans over thousands of years, as well as the relationship and cultural significances that uh, we associate with oak trees going back again for thousands of years, um, not just in Europe, but certainly here in the Americas, predominantly North, North and Central America, as well as Northern Africa and Asia. Uh, oak trees have been central um, focal points for various cultures all over the Northern Hemisphere. And oak trees only barely reach into South America and aren't actually in uh, south, uh, south of the equator in the Americas. So here at the transition from um, Sonoran Desert to uh, grassland in oak woodlands, we have the emery oak Quercus emorii as the predominant species. And this was the favored plant, uh, favored oak tree amongst the peoples of this region that would gather the acorns or bellotas. Bellota is still the common name for this tree as well as its acorn. Uh, which is a bit unusual in that oaks, uh, the tree, have a separate name for their fruit or nut, the acorn. Uh, that's very unique in, in certainly in the English language and for most trees across the world that usually the, the fruit or the nut of the tree is the same name as the tree, but acorn is different. So in this region, uh, they're known as bellotas and uh, as well as the trees, and that name comes over from Spain. And in fact, it's cognate with the, uh, the name for acorns in North Africa, um, in Morocco, I know they're known as Belut, and also in Israel, where oak trees um, have been for hundreds of thousands of years, and some of the oldest evidence of uh, hominid consumption of acorns, roughly 780,000 years ago, a very interesting time frame um, uh, was in the uh, Levant region, which is now Israel. So when people came over here from from Europe and uh, indirectly via Europe from North Africa via Europe over the last several hundred years, they brought with them a particular type of culture. And uh, not too far from where I'm at right now is actually a settlement of Basque sheep herders. And when they came here, they, they probably found something very similar to what they're accustomed to in grazing their animals uh, back home in Spain in the Basque country with um, rolling hills and mountains and grasslands and abundant oaks and uh, evergreen oaks, as a matter of fact. All of the oaks in this region, there's about um, two or three that I can see from where I'm seated, uh, emery oak, Arizona oak, and blue oak, they're all evergreens. In fact, only one oak in the state of Arizona is a deciduous oak. And in fact, that name, uh, Arizona, arguably, at least in part, derives from the, the arrival and presence of these Basque sheep herders uh, a few hundred years ago, um, approximately 300 years ago, settling in this area, not too far from here, in uh, a ranch, or settled an area and developed a ranch uh, where there was a spring and that spring became known as uh, Arizona and Rancho Arizona. And in turn, uh, apparently the name derived, uh, it's the name of the state was derived from, from that ranch. That ranch is in fact over the border into Sonora, Mexico. But what's distinct and, and very interesting about the name of that ranch is that it's not, uh, as many might presume, derived from Spanish, Castilian Spanish, to reflect that we're in a arid zone here. Uh, La Zona Arida might have been um, one of my original uh, interpretations of what Arizona meant or where it was derived from uh, and where its significance lied in the fact that we were in a desert 
environment. But if you look at the Basque language, and this has been written about by the state of Arizona in the centennial celebration um, earlier this century, that the Basque, in the Basque language, it's a three-part word, Arizona. I don't know how it's uh, spoken uh, exactly in the, in the Basque language. I'd love to learn that from a native Basque speaker. But in fact, that three-part word a phrase means uh, the land of the good oak. So in fact, this, this state's name is derived from the Basque term for their familiarity with, with oak trees. And so this, this particular area is, is abundant with emery oaks and it was the, it was the, the presence of the Basque sheep herders that brought note to that and um, presumably by this account would have given the state or this territory as it once was in the early 19th century and then um, statehood later on. So um, today there is still a culture uh, surrounding these uh, bellotas. The name is, uh, is a survival of that culture that also came from, from Europe and North Africa by way of the Spaniards, the Moors, and, and other, other types that came from that part of the world, Mediter broader Mediterranean, let's call it. The Mediterranean is essentially skirted by uh, various species of uh, evergreen oaks, all of which uh, their acorns were consumed for food. Many of them, in fact, consumed raw, right out of the shell, just like our emery oak. So you see me here taking the acorn out of the shell. It's a yellow acorn, I'll get close in a moment. There are still tannins present, but they're not exceptional and to the extent that you can eat them right out of the shell and people still do to this day. In fact, there's, a, there's an industry in northern Sonora of gathering these acorns and selling them on roadsides. Uh, not just as, you know, some um, gimmick for tourists, but in fact it's favored by, by locals. <clears throat> I've always found it interesting that someone can buy for um, three times the price of a bag of chips at the Oxo, a bag of acorns on the side of the road. And, and obviously by the continuation of this of this business, people still do, and they value it. They're not inexpensive by any means, the acorns. Um, and so it, it speaks even further to people's appreciation of this food, uh, whether it's just uh, cultural um, romanticism, you might say, or actually really appreciating the acorns, which I know many people do. There's a distinct flavor. Uh, they're oily as a red oak acorn that have a particularly high content of fats. Those are omega-6 fats, and I have noticed even storing at um, room temperature inside a house that's air conditioned throughout the year, uh, the, the fats could go rancid in, in the acorn. So um, to speak about the, the practicality of it for a moment, really upon gathering them, they're best stored in a freezer for a couple of days in the case that you're you're gathering, you may be gathering an acorn that has a weevil larva in it. And so you can kill that off quickly before the weevil is able to um, hatch, the larva is able to hatch and then begin consuming the, the nut meat of the acorn. Very likely won't consume, consume all of it, but if it consumes, consumes enough, it will essentially become inedible for the fact that it'll be full of the frass of, of the larva as well, its excrement. So um, a way to, to limit or avoid that is to simply put your freshly gathered acorns in the freezer and then, um, and then keep them in their shell so long as, as you're not gonna eat them because they're in a natural preservative state here. But as I said, um, I've also witnessed oils going rancid even in unshelled acorns because of the particularly high fat content and exposure to heat, light, and air will cause um, oxidation in oil. So if you have the space, keeping them in a refrigerator at the very least would be a great way to 
preserve the freshness of acorns. It's not to say that upon some degree of rancidity, the acorns are inedible because obviously people had limited ways of controlling climate uh, in ages past and still managed to consume a great deal of, of these acorns. So it's, um, it's a bit a matter of preference um, as, as well as what your, what your resources are to be able to freeze it or, or at least refrigerate it or not. But nonetheless, these acorns are edible right out of the shell. And what I want to show you, um, and that's, that's a very unusual thing in the world of, of acorns. Uh, most people expect acorns must be processed. Not only do they expect that acorns must be processed, they expect the acorns to be subjected to a great deal of processing uh, over a period of time, maybe several weeks or a couple of months. Most of the resources referring to acorn processing um, details uh, extensive um, water leaching. That can be done with these if you want to get out all the tannins whatsoever, but it's not necessary as the tannins are relatively minimal and such as such you can you can consume them right out of the shell. But I wanted to show you some details. Get up close. I'm not so sure about how this is focusing, but one thing I want to point out is the the white fuzz on the inside of the shell. With that white fuzz, you're I, you're able to identify this as a uh, acorn from the red oak group or black oak some may say technically it's it's more of red oak but and, and those two are, are interchangeable really um, and then the the nut meat is yellow indicating that it's relatively high in vitamin E You're starting to see some darkening here so that is more about it baking in the sun as these acorns could have fallen within the past month um, but more likely, I would guess, in the last couple weeks, but it's relatively dry, so they're still relatively fresh on the ground. But these acorns really need to be gathered up pretty quickly as they're highly susceptible to weevils falling in the in the summer rainy season. Um, and as is typical of a red oak, it sticks in the shell pretty well because they don't lose much size as they dehydrate. In fact, these red oak, these emery oak acorns don't really dehydrate much at all. You could store them, of course, for years and they'll still be soft enough to chew. So, decided to open up a few more. You can see some variation here. Hopefully you can see that all the open shells are white, fuzzy white, on the inside. And there's a bit of this light brown. Not just light in color, but light by weight substance. Um, most of it is fallen away already. That light brown substance is called the testa. It's like the skin on a peanut. There's a it's so light. Anyhow that tends to adhere to the nut in the red oak group. And in fact this one's this nut's completely covered with it now. So if I rub it, it starts to come off and then reveal the dark acorn underneath. Otherwise it's covered by the testa, which has been baked to a light pinkish beige color. But when it's, when it's freshly fallen from the tree, it's going to be a, a, a kind of a brick brown nutmeg color. So to tell if you have a red oak or a white oak, do you have a fuzzy inside of the shell? Red oak. Smooth inside of the shell? White oak. Do you have an adherent testa or that thin skin that sticks to the nut? Then you have a red oak. If you don't, does that uh, testa actually adhere to the inside of the shell, making it smooth? Then you've got a white oak. And not um, another trait that's not quite as indicative of the red oak, but is the yellow coloring of it may not have a yellow but if it does then you're pretty much asserted to have a red oak group acorn so the red oak group by and large um, have more oils some more so than others in fact some 
red oak groups such as California black oak can dry pretty hard as a, as a nut, whereas the emery oak is relatively high in fats and it never dries hard. It stays soft indefinitely. So that's a big difference between white oaks and, and red oaks by and large. White oaks, you'll crack your teeth on them basically if you try to chew them once they're dry. Very, very hard. They're more starchy and less fat. So in this area, um, people still to this day, 2020, are gathering acorns as food for, for commerce. Not too long ago, within the last couple decades, there was, not in addition to the commerce, a thriving culture, still a, a still extant culture of the Beoteros. Los Beoteros would travel great distance, some of them, with their families uh, by pickup truck or, or whatever means of vehicle that they could manage. Um, not too much long ago, a couple generations ago, people traveled by cart in Bordeaux, and then they would inhabit a, a large oak tree as their home and make their camp around it. And uh, as I've been told by, by those who witnessed this from, from young childhood on up into adulthood, that era un pueblo mágico, I've been told. It was a magical village. So people coming from all around to spend four to six weeks uh, gathering acorns, exchanging stories, uh, trading all sorts of craftsmanship and knowledge of the landscape through their stories and sharing this uh, openly and generously with each other while they engaged in uh, acorn gathering for commerce in which they would be able to sell these, these bellotas or trade them for other types of food and also for their own uh, sustenance and nourishment throughout the year. It has been studied uh, in California by David Bainbridge, who was, I believe, at UC Davis, um, that the indigenous in California, prior to most recent contact with the Spanish in the 16th century, were subsiding on predominantly acorn diets, upwards of 50 to 60 percent throughout much of the state. Uh, over extensive periods of time. Uh, maybe not exactly that much every year, but predominantly large bulk of their diet as acorns for centuries, for millennia. Some of the oldest evidence of acorn consumption, archeologically speaking, outside of say folk uh, oral history amongst the tribes is uh, about 7,500 years old. So roughly 5,500 BC. If I remember correctly, it's at least that old, if not a little bit older. Um, taken from uh, Mount Tamalpais, I believe, near the San Francisco Bay Area. And they were existing predominantly on acorns as a, as a s relatively settled um, hunter-gatherer uh, slash agricultural society cultivating the landscape not just the land in the way that we do, but cultivating the landscape in a very sustainable way to have that sort of culture last for thousands of years until um, interruption occurred, a major interruption occurred. And so that, that way of life um, quickly disintegrated as the people were no longer there to, to maintain it, in, or at least in greatly diminished numbers. But the oaks are still there, many of them, not all, not all in the same way, but people are now returning to acorn consumption in small pockets um, throughout the state of California. And maybe some, I should say, never left, but it was greatly diminished along the way. Here in the Sonoran Desert is has arguably some of the longest standing acorn consumption as a cultural trait in the world. Um, not just the tradition that was brought over by the Spanish and, and the Moors, you may say, but and, and that which married with indigenous culture but some indigenous cultures here in the broader Sonoran Desert region have their own contiguous history with acorn gathering consumption, namely the Apaches. In my personal experience, that's the one that stands out as I have met with people um, at a place called Oak Flat in Arizona, where emery oaks are abundant and their acorns are gathered there by local Apache people um, to the extent that I've been shown a uh, ground bag of acorn meal yellow as as emery oak would look and the, the woman who showed me this bag said it with great deal of 
honor and and reverence and humility this is who we are when she showed me that acorn flower so for me that was a very poignant moment that um, connected the present moment where i stood on the earth to these stories and traditions that i had read about or intuited or learned from the oaks themselves about the intimacy um, and respect that people had been accustomed to for so long uh, in relationship with the oaks. And the Emory Oak in our region is the epitome of that. As the most valued oak species in this region for, for many reasons, uh, there's other interesting traits about it, one of which is that it can grow clonally. Uh, aspen is another tree like that that many people are familiar with. Although emery oak is not known to cover such extensive ranges as aspen, uh, I have witnessed what seem to be whole hillsides of emery oak that have died at once uh, that could possibly have been one contiguous plant, uh, all interconnected underground. Um, large trunks over 12 inches, 16 inches, 18 inches is in diameter that were all interconnected underground. So it's a very interesting trait of this oak. Other oaks certainly do clump, but maybe not across hillsides that I'm aware of. So that's a very interesting trait of Quercus imorii. Another very uh, interesting experience that I had was camping underneath some emery oaks in May several years ago. There was a, a humming, a buzzing in the canopy of the emery oaks every morning and every evening, bees buzzing around. So it has nothing to do with the flowers because it was a month past any pollen or nectar for that matter, isn't any nectar, uh, floral nectar on, on an oak, but um, all pollen had been long, long gone. So that wasn't it. And it didn't really speak to why there'd be so many bees buzzing on top. Um, one of my students at the time uh, brought over uh, a glop of clear translucent sap that had fallen onto her mess kit from the tree above as I was looking for some pitch um, to run a, a friction fire, hand drill fire. And when, as soon as she brought that to me, I had a sense that I needed to taste this and it was essentially pure glucose. And I looked where her mess kit was, the tent, and looked up and then put two and two together and realized that's what the bees had been foraging for since we'd been there. And, and so there's something that was being exuded by the tree that was then being consumed potentially by aphids and then excreted upon the surface of the leaves. At least I have literature that speaks to this event, not being able to get up there and see exactly what was going on, but by the presence of the glob of translucent sap, it showed me that there must must have been some exit by the tree because there wouldn't be that much, you know, sap. There wouldn't be that much exit from, or lack, you might call it, from an insect on the tree. So that was actually coming from the tree. So it's quite possible that the bees were consuming that. And it's known that bees, when when they're, um, the, the breadth and the, the amount of floral diversity is diminished that they'll resort to consuming um, these simple um, sucrose glucose uh, saps off of trees and um, if they do that for too long it actually induce a colony collapse as the whole colony gets diarrhea from these um, really simple sugars so hopefully that wasn't the case but nonetheless it was the sap coming off of the trees and and researching looking into that there were references to the manna from heaven uh, as if this um, exudate from the oak trees these evergreen oak trees that are also present throughout the mediterranean was in fact that manna from heaven that was written about so just an interesting thought but it's um nonetheless a very sweet and um, highly concentrated sugary substance being excreted by an otherwise bitter and astringent plant in the desert, which is pretty fascinating. Not too much unlike the saguaro fruit, which would have been fruiting um, at a similar time 
as as that was happening with the with the emery oak again uh under the most adverse conditions hottest and driest of the year is, is putting out a very sweet and delectable substance so the emery oak has has many different layers to it and as we look closely and spend more time uh, aspects of this begin to unfold and i believe that is is wrapped up in the cultural heritage that uh, on the surface at least uh, many people uh, speak about and refer to amicably and and um, and honorably in in their homage to and respect for and joy surrounding uh, this tree species so that's just a little bit that i wanted to share today on oaks uh, there's always more but um uh, i guess maybe to to wrap up quickly because we didn't see the tree too closely although you're looking at the tree right behind me the whole time get a close-up of some of the leaves as is the case with all oaks the leaves are variable but that gives you an idea they're leathery with toothed margins the bark has a particular checked appearance to it And regarding other oak species in the area, these are kind of the shinier green leaves, a bit more of a green-yellow contrast, whereas others, um, other evergreen oaks in this region are going to have a, a paler coloration to them, kind of a blue-green or grayish-green color. One, uh, one, um, one, uh, Exemption to that rule might be Quercus turbinella, but it has a much shorter, smaller habit, and it's a white oak as well. That's Sonoran scrub oak. And that can hybridize with other white oak species. But that's one of the other unique things about emery oak being a black oak or red oak. I use the two terms interchangeably. In this region, it pretty much stands in pure dead genetically although it can intermix a bit with silver leaf oak in some areas but areas like this you won't find silver leaf oak so emery oak is pretty much a pure purebred you might say and that it doesn't intermix with other species of oak and it tends to be a relatively tall oak most of these before me here are all, all the tallest ones or emery oak. They can reach up heights of 30, 35 feet in the right condition. So another time uh, we'll take a closer look at the acorns and maybe talk about some of the food history surrounding emery oak acorns. Um, and for now I'll just leave you with a, one last image of the acorns as they appear on the ground.